Hello, everyone. This is Bethlehem Artfield. Welcome to the podcast Journey to Ethiopia with a story. In this episode, I'll be reading an excerpt from my translation of Alangan Namaser by Adam Retta. I'll also share a few insights about the translation process. The whip and the lentils. Mazuka, mother. Mazuka had me from her second marriage. From time to time, she says, I would have been better off with my first husband. I don't know if she meant this or she said it in jest to annoy my father. My father would then open his wide barrel of a mouth and let out a loud laugh. <laughs> I suppose this is either because of his introvert nature or an attempt to disguise his jealousy. My mother's hair is as white as cotton. I guess I'm the only boy in the neighborhood whose mother's hair has turned completely gray at a young age. I'm also the only boy who has a mother that openly displays affection with her husband. She is the only one who has a particular shade of brown complexion that reminds one of a certain delicacy. The only one that teenagers tend to take a second look at and say, Freo's mother is cute, isn't she? I am the only one who has a mother named Luo, enunciated with a delicate touch of the tongue on the larynx, just like the way one savors a candy. She shows loving kindness openly, waiting for me at the gate of our house when I come back from school, letting me wrap myself around her legs and smell her day and what she's been up to. I cover my entire face with her dress and try to find out what kind of food she cooked that day. I guess she is the only mother that couldn't tell the purpose of this ritual. Thus, I discover that on some days she smells of lard and butter. I don't like this scent. It tells me that on this day she has been favoring my dad. A day she pampers him with rich food. When I pick up the smell of legumes and a trace of light cooking oil, then I know my zuka has made me my favorite. The incomparable, fit for fairers, lentils too. Primary school living exam. My mother has a widely admired cotton dress made by our village weaver, an ethnic Dorsey. He is a bearded man with fair complexion. Whenever he finishes an order, he goes out to an open area where he lines his spun cotton and dances his ethnic Dorsey dance by himself. We kids know of this ritual and eagerly await to see him dance. He said he danced a spectacularly celebratory dance on the day he finished making the cotton fabric from my mother's famous dress. It was a large fabric wide enough to make the over 300 seams the dress had. He compared this challenge to that of sitting for a primary school living exam. When his listener smokingly asked if he had yet to take the secondary school living exam, he retorted, Shut up, you slanderers! You lot are muddled hooligans who make fun of one's respectable livelihood. Maybe that's why I'm still bound by my mother's whims while other kids rebel against their mothers. I mean, maybe I'm unable to appreciate the sun, the moon and the stars because I'm usually hidden between the seams of her dress and bewitched by the aroma of her lentil stew. Of all the legumes in this world, I find nothing more fascinating than lentils. Who were they? The musician crooned. Those who ate the lentils too, intertwined on top or riveted well in the tiny holes of the injera, as if they were made precisely for that reason. My little hands, gathering the injera soaked with broth, and lo and behold, send the soft and fluffy morsel smoothly down my throat and settle in my tummy. My fingers, whether washed or not, bearing the traces of the dark niger seed oil. At that age, 
I was usually preoccupied either by studying for a primary school leaving exam or playing football, and in between, going in search of lentil stew. I wish I could play football all the time, but my father warned me against chasing the balloon. That's what he calls football. If I get bad grades at school, he would say, You eat. He means you fill your gut with lentils. You play. He means you chase your balloon. And you get these grades? My father is a violent man. When he towers over me and shouts with his saliva spraying about my actual or perceived mistakes, I get reminded of cold rain splattering over a concrete floor. Maybe this image comes to mind because he usually proclaims that my command is concrete. Although I didn't clearly understand what he meant at the time, it became evident to me when I disobeyed his orders and ended up being flung against the very thing. Although my father is by nature an introvert, he commanded an unconstitutional power not only over me, but most of the children in our neighborhood. When I punish, I do it with patience. Once the boy did such a thing. The other day, when he was passing by, I saw him do such and such thing, and I kept quiet. One afternoon, the other week, he did. He goes on telling my wrongdoings, all of which were true. Then his anger explodes, and he looks around to grab for whatever pot is lying around to lash out an attack, an assault which puts Hannibal to shame. I found out about the great general Hannibal while studying for my primary school living exam. My father holds himself upright when he sits, like someone who had swallowed a stick. I think this helps him to withhold from joining in chit-chats and instead inspect his surroundings like an alpha cockerel. Those who don't know him well say, why is he sitting with such attention like a soldier awaiting a command? My mother also teases him about it. He responds, I'm just minding my business. Oh, really? Your business? She keeps on teasing. Right. If you can't mind your own business, I'll show you like I show your son, he retorts. Then they both burst out laughing. I just smile afraid to laugh out loud because I know what it feels like when he deals out his punishment. When we were young, we tend to forget a lot of things that had happened to us, including the pain of punishment. We were all like that, except a few timid ones. One day, my father was sitting upright as usual. Without moving, he called out, Listen! Exams are approaching fast but you don't seem to be bothered at all. A priest who lost his sash would be more bothered. I didn't understand what he meant. I was aware of the upcoming national exams at the beginning of that year, but eventually I lost interest as I was more focused on organizing a football club. In September, a few of my friends and I started a football club named Yera. From now on, I don't want to see you on that football field. On the weekends, you should go to Kirpru to study with him. His face looked grim as he said this. When he is serious, his face looks like that. There is no kindness or mildness on his face. The dark stubble on his light complexion looks like thorns. His brown eyes seem dilated. The two vertical creases on his iron khaki trouser legs seem sharp. He rhythmically taps his leather shoes. Did you hear me? Yes. Yanita, master. My parents sleep on a double bed. Yanita, or master as we call it, is usually placed on a darker corner of their bedroom. Whenever my parents claim they were bored with the bedroom furniture arrangements, they change the position of the bed to yet another dark corner. 
Maybe there is just not enough light in this room. To this day, I assume that beds should be placed in a dark corner of a room. There were two bedspreads that alternately get washed and cover their bed on weekly basis. Both are bright red. The pillowcases are adorned with flower patterns. I'm not really interested in these details. My attention is usually drawn to Yenita. I gaze at it with fear and awe, like it was the Ark of the Covenant. Yenita hangs by the wall behind the bed. Whenever the bed position changes, Yenita's position on the wall also changes. Yenita, master, is the name I gave the whip. My father hung Sienita on the wall directly above the bed. So if my father sees me on the football field, I know what will await me. There is a reason why I named the whip Yenita. I went to a traditional preparatory school to learn to read from a clergyman. The Yenita, master of the school, was a friend of my father's. When I was ready to move to grade school, my father said to the master, Now my son is about to go to grade school. He may not study as hard as he does now without the help of your whip. So, can you please get me a whip as good as yours? The master, who was more interested in dealing out punishments with his whip than teaching, said, That is absolutely necessary, as discipline is lacking in great schools. The whip is like a daily medication for stubborn boys who are nuisance to their elders. Your boy knows that. I have even bitten him twice to caution him not to think about disobedience. I will certainly order the craftsman to make an extra whip for you. The whip has a handle of braided wires laminated with leather. At the bottom of the handle, the leather makes a small loop. The loop is attached to a string of leather about two centimeters wide and a hundred centimeters long. I heard it's made of God's skin. There is a saying, a child bitten with God's skin declares that he will do no wrongdoings ever. That might be the reason I hate gods and noisy people. So, on the days I disobey, Yenita intercedes between my behavior and I through its jig and lash on my body. Thus, the whip named Yenita became famous even among my friends. My friend Kibru usually teases me if I annoy him. You stop that right now or I'll tell your father and he will give you a taste of Yenita. The hand that feeds. On the days that I get punished, I don't go home until late in the evening. The hate that boils inside me makes me avoid home. I only go back for fear of the dark. It is his arrogance, my parents muse. Even when I'm starving, I loiter around to delay getting home. However, I make sure I'm nearby, so in case I get scared by a hyena or a wild dog, I can run and escape to the safety of my home. My first hideaway place is the play area. I don't mind if there were other children there or not. I just amble around in the middle of the quietness. Towards the evening, I go across the field and the houses and get closer to the road. I don't feel like talking to my friends. The noises from the games and the bouncing balls sound to me like hacking coughs caused by the winter's chill. People who know me would know why I was acting this way. He must have had a taste of Yenita, they say. I shout back insults. Bastards! Stinkers! Rotten scabby! I don't really use the F word. In my mind, vulgarities involved sex. My friends and I thought the swear words we used were mild compared to those. When it starts to get dark, I stroll at a distance where I can see our house. 
Long after the other children head back home, I casually walk in the cold evening as if I'm waiting for someone. When my parents finally get anxious, my mother would wrap herself in her scarf and come out looking for me. I pretend not to have seen her and I walk away. She finally catches up with me and stops me from going further away. Frustrated, I just sit on the edge of the road. She also squats next to me and wordlessly looks at me in those eyes. I look down. She puts her warm hands around my head and pulls me for a kiss on my cropped hair. I know back in the house with my father, she was probably accusing me of being conceited. Even if I'm only a kid, I understand that much. In the darkness, I see her smiling face. My sweet fragrance. Come now, she coaxes me. I tap the ground with my feet as I stifle my tears. She knows I'm about to cry, so she pulls me and hugs me closer. Then I get the waft of the lentil stew from her cotton scarf. My tummy rumbles. She waits for me to cry in the privacy of the dark night, covered by her cotton scarf and afraid of being judged. Even if I'm only a kid, I understand that much. We stay like that for a while. Then I reach out with both arms and hug her in reconciliation. She kisses me on my head. Apology and forgiveness are conducted in action and spoken. She grabs my hand and leads me back home. When my father hears our footsteps, he retreats to the bedroom. We avoid each other the next day or sometime the day after that as well. To this day, the saying fed by a mother's hand does not appeal to me as the epitome of mother's affection. Even UNICEF feeds children. Your mother, why don't you say to be cuddled in mother's arms instead? Even if I'm only a kid, I understand that much. Thank you for listening. I would like to share with you a few insights about the translation process. As you know, mazuka is an urban slang for mother. If used without any translation, it will not make sense to international readers. That's why I decided to put in bracket mother. Once the reader is exposed to what it implies, then I did not see the need to stick to it anymore. Besides allusion, the story is full of similes, metaphors and rhetorical questions as tools for semantic deviation. For example, my mother's hair is as white as cotton. Here, if this simile was translated with a focus to target culture, it would have been as white as snow. But I purposely kept the cultural aspect of the source language. If this was translated directly, her brown complexion is the same shade as pan-fried mutton, it would completely throw an international reader off because in Caucasian and Asian societies, the color of fried meat can't be considered beautiful. Um, So I decided to leave the option open for the reader to fill in what they perceive as a delicacy in their culture. She is the only one who has a particular shade of dark brown complexion that reminds one of a certain delicacy. This brown delicacy could be chocolate or tips, depending on the culture and imagination of the reader. Who else was there? The musician crooned. An allusion to the famous song by Muhammad Ahmed. This is an intertextual literary technique weaving the lyrics of the classical song to infer another context. This shows the depth of a prominent literary culture. This fact, however, could be lost on the international reader. But if I had put facts like these on footnotes, the story would have ended up looking like an ethnographic textbook. We would like to hear your views and any comments you may have. If you'd like to listen to more stories as soon as they come out, please subscribe to this podcast. I would also appreciate it if you click on the like button and share with family and friends so we get more listeners. Until the next story, goodbye.